last month to be home for an entire month. So 30 days in a row, so they've been calling me Domestic Steve. I've been trying to fix everything, cleaning the garage and, and everything else. It's been, a, it's been a, an amazing experience. I will tell you to be able to see uh, the leadership uh, not only uh, displayed in my home, my wife serves as a chief judge in our circuit at, at home, to see the incredible two young ladies that we're developing uh, to be prayerfully global leaders. Um, they are always inspired when they come to the U.S. Conference of Mayors and see the incredibly high caliber of public sector leaders and private sector leaders and philanthropic leaders that we have here at this conference. It has been a privilege of me to work with the leadership that's represented here in this room. Uh, women mayors are critically important to this organization. Uh, and, and if you're important to this organization, you're important to the future of this great democracy. I'm so excited uh, to introduce the mayor of San Leandro, uh, Pauline Cutter, the chair of the Leadership Alliance of the Women's of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, she's going to be leading today's session. I've had a wonderful opportunity over the last several years to spend quality time with her and her family, and I will tell you she contributes immensely uh, to the direction and trajectory of this organization. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Cutter. Thank you. Um, hello and welcome everybody. Um, let's see if we have any men out here in the audience. Let's see. Uh, yeah, you know what? I just have to say that um, congratulations and thank you for being here. Um, because the women especially, but um, you know, it, it, this is an issue, a gender issue, but it's an issue that um, half of the population uh, really cares about. So I'm glad that most of the other half cares about it too. So um, I'm proud to serve as the chair of the Women's Mayor's Leadership Alliance and um, I want to welcome you to this plenary session. Um, so a couple little facts. Um, we're going to talk about some facts but then we're going to flip it and say okay now how can we take those facts and turn them into something positive. So um, women can expect to earn only 80.5 percent of the male counterparts earnings annually. Therefore, the wage gap is currently at 19.5% in the US. The figure typically ranges from 78 to 82%. However, if you're a woman of color, you experience a larger wage gap. In 2016, black women earned 62.5, while Hispanic women earned only 54.4 of their white male counterparts. Labor force participation is much lower for women than men, only 47% of women participate in the labor force worldwide, while 72% of the men do. And in the United States, 57% of the women participate in the labor force. And women hold only 22%, I'm gonna say that again, women hold only 22% of the senior leadership positions in private sector globally. These inequities perpetuate the lack of women in leadership positions in public and private sector. And this is something that we want to start conversations, continue conversations, and then make some action about this. So now I'm honored to have four of my colleagues here. Um, they're leaders in our panel, and they're going to help us discuss this. First, we have the mayor, Latoya Contrell, of the city of New Orleans. Mayor Contrell was sworn in as the first female mayor of New Orleans last May, after previously serving on the New Orleans City Council. As the former president of the Broadmoor Improvement Association, Mayor Cantrell led the neighborhood's redevelopment following Hurricane Katrina, and she's pledged to make New Orleans a more equitable city for all of its residents, and she's going to teach me how to say New Orleans right, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next we have Nancy McFarland from Raleigh, North Carolina. Mayor McFarland currently serving her third term as mayor following the election to the Raleigh City Council in 2007. Under her leadership, Raleigh has grown as one of the top cities in the country to live, work, and play. And she's pursued a policy agenda to make supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs happen. Mayor McFarland also serves as the city's Economic Development and Innovation Committee. Welcome. 
Next, we have Mayor Karen Weaver from Flint, Michigan. A native of Flint, Mayor Weaver was sworn in as mayor in 2015 and has received national praise for her leadership during the city's water crisis. I'm sure you heard about this earlier today. Before taking office, Mayor Weaver served as Director of Behavioral Services in the Mott Children's Health Center and Chief Operating Officer of the Ennis Center for Children. And she's also a small business owner. Welcome, Mayor Weaver. And finally, we have Janice Balder. She's president of the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Before joining J.P. JP Morgan Chase, she served as the director of economic policy for the National Council of La Raza, the largest Latino civic rights and advocacy organization in the United States. Janice also served as a project manager at the Flamingos Foundation, a community developed corporation serving Cleveland. We appreciate her commitment to philanthropy and public-private partnerships. Thank you for your service and joining us in this session. I always crack up at these chairs because if I really sat back, my legs would be going like this. So, um, so we have some questions here, and at the end, we may take, if we have enough time, we may take some questions from the audience, but um, the highlight is also going to be a visit from my rep, uh, Barbara Lee, from Congress. She's going to say a few words. Um, hopefully, they're voting. As Nancy Pelosi said, she'll get her vote in, and then she'll be here. So first question, and this will be for all the mayors, um, have you... Um, can you tell us about any personal experiences with gender-based barriers in your education, your previous jobs, or public service? And if so, how has it guided your policy? Would you like to? Okay. We're very collaborative here. So um, restate that question again. So can you tell us about personal experiences with gender-based barriers in your education, previous jobs, or public service. Okay, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take uh, the current position uh, that I'm in as mayor and being the first uh, female mayor in 300 years of the city of New Orleans. Well, thank you for that. Uh, but, you know, the greatest gratification is knowing that I will not be the last. That's what this is really all about. Um, but um, what I will do, I'll park it here simply because as I have... Um, Peel back some of the issues and challenges facing the city of New Orleans. I'll take, um, well, I can take many. I can take, you know, housing. I can look at how the city of New Orleans is not, a particular issue may not be getting her fair share as it relates to the revenue. I, I'd walk up with my chief of staff or someone and they'd start talking because they need to get talked to the mayor. And they're t I'm like, I'm over here. I'm over here because assumptions were always made that it had to be the man that was with you, was the mayor and not me. And I remember someone talking to him and he's talking and talking and talking. And I, I was trying to tell him, you are talking with the mayor. And so finally he said, if you could have this conversation with the mayor for me, I said, I'll have it with myself as soon as I get into the office. Those, I mean, those kinds of things happen. And um, it's, it was just really, really interesting uh, because I don't think we're, taken as seriously. Sometimes it's, oh, well, if you're smiling, you must be weak. Uh, I'm thinking I'm smiling because I'm thinking about how I'm going to get you. <laughs> and I just don't want you to know what I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> but, but it is, it's, it's, so, sometimes there are just subtle things that we've had to deal with as women uh, when you walk into the room and they're not expecting you to have a, a, a strong voice and to make tough decisions and to be able to sit at the table with the rest of the men that are there. Uh, I, S small things even though. There were small things. I remember saying, I'd like a mirror in the bathroom over here because I'd like to look at my hair in the back, you know. I mean, come on. They, they, the, the maintenance people said, there's makeup in here. I said, yes, it's a woman's bathroom now. I mean, so there were just small things that people weren't ready for. They're not ready for women to be in these kinds of positions. And they can be blatant with it or they can not be so blatant, but just assume uh, the, the male with you is the one in charge and that you can't do things and you can't lead. And um, 
it's, it's, it's fun being underestimated as a woman. Uh, that has worked to our advantage to be underestimated uh, because then they never know what's coming at you. But we see it all the time, every day. Well, shaking hands, sometimes I'll go to the man next to you just because it gravitates there. Or sometimes what I feel is um, I'm a real collaborative person generally, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to ask you your opinion. I'm good. But that doesn't mean I'm weak. Exactly. You know, it means that I'm trying to get to the bottom so we can have something to build on, and then we're going to go up from there. And sometimes people just don't get that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so how about gender um, inequity in the financial services? Are there? Well, <laughs> Um, well, I would, I would pick up on what I've heard from my other colleagues here. I mean, I, f for me, the way I think about this in our work is our, a lot of times our biggest challenges are also the source of our biggest strengths. And so personally in my own life, my, my grandmother was raised by a single mom during the Great Depression. She was a single mom that raised my mom. My mom was a single mom for a while. Very fortunate that that is not my current circumstances, but I am a working mom with a really big job, and I come from a long line of really strong women. And understanding that the, the wealth gap, the income gap that we face is money left on the table. These, when we invest in women, we're not stopping just there. That has ripple effects for their families, for their communities. And so that's the perspective that we take both from a philanthropic, um, which is my job, I'm president of the foundation, but also as a firm. I'm really proud that we have 50% of our operating committee is women. We have women on our board. And last September, we put a big stake in the ground launching Women on the Move, um, saying that we want to do better and we want to be the leading bank for women as a place to work, as a place to bank, and as a uh, bank serving our community. So we put a big goal out there of lending $10 billion to women. I think it's important that it's not represented just by our philanthropy. Again, that's my day job. But it's baked into who we are as a business. So that kind of brings up a question. Um, traditionally, women have the role of the family, and, and you hear a lot about single moms, not so much about single dads. And with that, three out of four single parent families are headed by a female. In the U.S., 29% of the families are headed by single women, and they live below the poverty line. So um, how do we lift those kids up, and how do we lift those parents up and give the support to the women to give them a lift up not necessarily a handout. Mayor McFarland, I'll start with you. Oh, um, you know, that's a great question. To me, the first thing that jumps out is access to childcare. It is so difficult and it is such a limiting factor in a woman's ability to, to work. I mean, if, if you've heard Ruth Bader Ginsburg and many other women talk about how that affected their early careers and just how difficult it was. And, you know, so many women I know that, you know, even had to have a mother work or somebody move in, a family member, just so they could work. I mean, and, and we see it a lot in, um, you know, working with the youth in our city. We have some uh, special camps that the uh, are run by our police department for youth empowerment, and they have some that are specifically targeted on girls. And one of the officers told me, you know, he went to pick her up because he knew it was going to be a problem to get her there. And when he got there, her, you know, she's dressed and crying, and her mom says she ain't going anywhere because she's got to watch these other kids. I got to go to work. And so it's not just that; it, it has effects on, you know, all of the all the ch kids in multiple generations, but it's also an issue for the entire family, as you talked about. You know, it's, it's single women, obviously that's a big part, but even, you know, women in marriages, it's still, it's still difficult. I think childcare is a big barrier. Yeah, we've no, I would agree with you, that, and that's something we have to be sensitive to. Uh, I, I think about when I was at my children's health center, and I remember I, I thought, there were times that my husband would have to get the kids to school because I would have a meeting early in the morning, but I remember after they were a certain age, I said, I'm at work on time every day. And having employers that are sensitive and understanding to those kinds of needs and issues uh, is critical. But I was also thinking about when you were talking about empowering women in the workplace as well, and you were saying something about your, your committee and how many of them are made up of women. And somebody came to me, and I had not even paid this any attention because I'm just hiring great people. But they told me that, wow, you sure have hired, you've got a lot of women in here. And I thought, yeah, about half, I mean, 
we're half the population. They represent about half of the staff. I didn't think it was a lot. They were just the people that were uh, most qualified in those positions. But showing women in those kinds of positions is really, really important. And, and, I've, and one of the things I've learned is how important and how encouraging and how uh, supportive it is for other women to see those things happening because it lets them know that they can do those things as well. Uh, when we talk about businesses, and you were talking about uh, business, and when you think about uh, entrepreneurship and small businesses, a lot of those are women. And so one of the things I wanted to make sure of is that we had somebody in place with our economic development team that was focused on small business and entrepreneurship, uh, especially because women are so represented in those areas. And so we've really been working hard uh, to make sure uh, we you know, we're connecting with them and getting them hooked up with the resources and the services and all of the things that they need to be able to get through that and to, to build their career. So those are some of the things we've been looking at is how do you support women in these roles? Yeah, can I start with just a shout out to all the working moms in the audience? Um, because that is, uh, it's real, whether you know, you're a single mom or, or, you, or you have a partner, um, you know, I just had an administrator from my daughter's school um, ask me, uh, you know, how, if I thought about the implications for my daughter of my travel schedule um, after I had just come back from a big international trip and I said, yeah, it's amazing because every time I travel, I like get my daughter books and we go over the cities and she knows that her mom has a big important job and I'm doing something that inspires me every day. And oh, by the way, my job is to help communities across the globe. And so I hope I'm setting a strong example for her. Um, and while I was stepping down from my soapbox, I noticed that this particular administrator was not really impressed with my response at all, which is like, <laughs> It was like, oh, well, we don't have very many moms who travel as much as you do. And I was like, well, maybe we can work on recruiting some new moms to the school. <laughs> um, but the, um, in terms of how we support women, so I think one of the things that we're really focused on, both as a business and as a philanthropy, is on helping moms save and helping um, women save in general. So the research would tell us that children born to low-income parents, but who are frequent savers of any amount, are more likely to move out of the bottom uh, quintile and move up the economic ladder. Children who have low-income parents, but have any amount of savings for college are more likely to go because we've reset the expectations for them. So when we think about both how to help women as well as how to support their children, starting small can make a really big difference in really changing the course of their lives but also changing the economic trajectory for their children. Well, and what I will add, uh, a couple things. Uh, one is the investment, absolutely, we have to do better with, with child care. I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. But we uh, in New Orleans has doubled, uh, first of all, on the New Orleans City Council move to where the city would put a little skin in the game as it relates to early childhood education. This year, doubling that amount to $1.5 million going to early childhood. But a couple other things. Uh, created an office of youth and families so that we can centralize resources throughout the city um, so where moms, you know, mothers can know uh, where they can access these resources that can potentially help them. Um, we implemented even stress-free uh, days, uh, whether it's yoga, massages. I opened up a meditation room in, in City Hall as well. Uh, we had a uh, little hurricane scare uh, this last season, and we found that it wasn't coming our way. And on the front end, well, we had canceled, um, canceled the day. Basically, you're off work. And so when we found the hurricane wasn't coming, I said, oh, no, we're getting back to work now, but you can bring your kids to work. And so then I activated police, fire, EMS, uh, had pink berry and yogurt and had the kids there, and it was a great, great time. And so we are making sure that we implement those bring your kids to work days just throughout the year so it's not just about, you know, if a hurricane doesn't come. Um, but just being intentional, again, about how you um, appreciate and value your, empl your employees, particularly women, uh, and um, if they have to take their 
um, kids to, to the doctor, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, if they have to also go to parent-teacher conference, you know, it's okay. So you are creating an environment that is a supportive system uh, within city government that I hope to transcend to just throughout uh, the city as a whole. Okay, um, so now th there's a couple, two burning questions that I want. And the first one is, have you experienced anything um, deciphering the different generations? So we've got the millennials, we've got the baby boomers, how we did it as a baby boomer you know, society, and now we've got millennials, and you know, there's all these things that they talk in Gen X, um, you know, they're only gonna have one car, and they're gonna live close to transit, and they're gonna do this, and they're gonna do that. Well, what's that say for their daycare? What's it say for the jobs they get, and so forth? Do you have any special um, programs or anything like that, and have you noticed a difference actually in the course of doing business with um, different kind of um, society norms that different you know groups will take so let's see Karen we're well, gonna start with uh, I, one of the things we've been doing uh, is really trying to reach out and work with the Millennials more um, I think some of that has come from uh, coming from Flint and, and, and being from Michigan, where we had so many cities taken over by emergency manager and not having a voice, having your voice taken, and so letting them know how important it is to have a voice at the table. And so we've been very intentional about working with millennials and having Millennial Day at City Hall and doing something almost every month to reach out and engage millennials and letting them know that they are important and their voice matters and I need them to be part of the decision-making team. Um, you know, it was interesting. I remember, and, and some people don't want you to do those kinds of things. I remember the uh, when we were doing this, somebody called City Hall. Uh, they didn't know the person in charge was a millennial uh, that was, you know, uh, doing Millennial Day for us. And they said, you know, why is she doing something, uh, inviting millennials to City Hall and to be part of government? Everyone knows, you know, all they do is sit in their parents' basement and, and get high. And it was so funny, she came to me, she said, does he realize that the message he left was on a millennials uh, recorder? They turned out in big number. They turned out in big number, and I was just so happy uh, because they needed to know that they're not, uh, don't let people make decisions for you and about you be part of the decision-making process. And also, they needed to know that uh, not only are they making decisions with us, but they're making decisions for themselves. We make decisions that uh, you know, are put in place for years, so this is for their kids, this is for their parents, parents, uh, me, I want them to be part of that. So we've really been intentional about reaching out to millennials. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you'll get something where we want to engage our seniors. We don't want them to feel left out as well. And so uh, you, you, you really have to be inclusive. That's one of the things we talk about here at the Conference of Mayors is being inclusive and reaching out to all of the different populations uh, and segments of, of, you know, in our community. So we've been working on that, and I'll tell you, it's made a difference in how we are doing things uh, at City Hall, uh, who's coming uh, to be part of things, and I think it's a decision we made, and it's for the better, and I, that's something we're gonna continue to do and see how we can broaden those kinds of things at City Hall. Yeah, I, I'll pick up on that. I think it's really important. Um, you know, I will say, as a, as a Gen Xer, I often feel like Jan Brady, where it's like, millennials, 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 instead of Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, I think thinking about where um, different generations are in their life cycle is really important. We are very focused on, um, on elder baking and what are the challenges that um, the 60 plus community are, are going to face. We're about to have the largest wealth transfer in, that our country has ever seen. Um, that's critically important important both from uh, how, we're, how we're supporting and servicing those individuals, but also from a fraud protection perspective. And we're really seeing an uptick in, um, in kind of elder fraud abuse situations. Unfortunately, it's often people close to the victim. Um, and so that's a real challenge and something we're trying to get really smart on and think about what more we can do to support our elderly customers. Um, and then from a, from a millennial perspective, one thing I'll say is um, what I often hear from, um, from various stakeholders, both inside my organization and, and outside my organization, is 
we have to teach these kids how to use a checkbook. I'm like, no, actually, you don't, because they don't use checkbooks anymore. Um, you do need to know how to use your account. You do need to learn how to be smart with your money. But we're really looking at the way that um, um, FinTech is completely transforming the way people bank, the way they manage their money. And so when we think about traditional outreach from financial institutions around things like financial literacy, we're trying to completely reimagine the way we do that because the way that people bank is, is changing. And so we want to be able to meet people where they are. I think that the, um, the real focus is on inclusion across the board. And when you're intentional about that, I mean, everyone wants a, a, you know, a quality of life, being able to access uh, resources and activities. Basically, you, know, you live, work, worship, play, where you, you know, and engage where you live. And so I'm looking to scale up an initiative I started um, as a council member creating one of the first educational corridors in the city to where you can go and get, you know, the seniors are there in the center, you know, the, it's adjacent also to the library, also to the school, and so you have various ages um, from young to, to old, but activating and building community amongst themselves, which is very important. But when we talk about millennials, I love them. They have the courage and they have that fire and that drive. And I tell you, um, through technology and social media, I mean, you have to meet them where they are. But they are the ones that's truly helping me drive, you know, hashtag fair share for the city of New Orleans because they want better streets, better roads, you know, drainage. They want to invest in the city. And once they understand that a destination city does not really reap the benefits of the revenue that she generates, I mean, they're really at the forefront. And so um, it's, it's how we engage and build community, and it really does start with inclusion, and everyone matters, and their voices really need to be heard. So I found with, uh, you talk about the different groups, Gen X and Millennials and Baby Boomers, part of it is what you touched on, which is really finding out what is important to each of those groups, and then, to me, it's developing the right tools, because, developing a digital online presence, you're gonna get obviously a lot more engagement from the millennials and the younger. I've also noticed a lot of difference in startups. So I started a business in 2002, so, um, and I started it with taking out a second on my house. So I was older, I had the advantage of having a house, and I see so many kids out of college that are you know, they want to start a company and they're in the incubator and they're all about venture, venture, venture and getting all this money. And I'm like, yeah, they, you're giving your company away. You know, it's like this different mindset. They don't, you know, I've met a couple that have really bootstrapped their business. And it, but it was very, very intentional. And I see that as a big difference in entrepreneurship. Um, but I also see a lot of young women that are in that 30s, range that have young kids that are super engaged. And I think it's a combination of, you know, what's going on politically across the country. And now that they're starting to have children, they're really, you know, concerned. Um, we have a group in Raleigh called Act Far Activating Families Across Raleigh that my daughter might have started. But um, she said, you know, you were always active and you did things all along, but I never felt like you left us. And so the premise is you shouldn't have to leave your family to advocate for your family. So they involve their kids in everything. I mean, they'll go to a park and make bee hats and everything, and then they take them on Saturday to the March on Science for the legislature. So it's really, you know, finding all these creative groups that are doing these amazing things on their own and then pulling them all in and making them understand, you know, the community is you. It doesn't have to originate from City Hall, but, you know, let's figure out how we all join together to make this place better. Okay, so talking about solutions and um, best practices and so forth. So Tell us about your favorite woman-led enterprise or woman-owned small business in your city and what, if anything, your city did in, through policy or laws or anything like that to help. You want me to start? Oh, well, see, I've, I'm going to have a, a bit of an advantage here where I get to go and work with entrepreneurs and small business owners in um, across the country. I'm also at high risk here because I feel like naming a city could be a really dangerous. <laughs> um, but um, 
There are so many women that I've been inspired by when, um, when I go out to the various cities where we work. And rather than picking one, let me say this. Um, I think when, you, we, when we talk about how we support small businesses, um, we often talk about it as a false choice between how we're supporting those high growth, what's happening in the incubators and accelerators, and what's the next gazelle that's gonna like really make it in your city, and who are the makers and bakers. And I think women and people of color, we often talk about them like they're in the maker and baker and not in the high growth space. Um, and so one set of resources kind of goes to the high growth and a different set of resources go to, say, our main street businesses. Um, the answer is it's both and, and our communities, women, people of color, we ha start businesses in both of these places. And we should be thinking about diversity and pipelines and how we support women scientists and tech entrepreneurs and who are in the bio and life space, as well as who's, you know, who's hustling to get their cupcakes moving at the farmer's market and now is going to be distributing in Whole Foods. Um, and you know across uh, across the country. So I've met um, I've met women. Um, I, okay, I'm going to give a shout out to a favorite um, uh, in our work in Detroit. Sorry, because she's amazing. This woman, April, um, April's good cakes and bakes. Um, because she was this woman who started out in her kitchen, and uh, you know we order from her frequently when J.P. Morgan Chase comes to town in Detroit, which is often. And uh, the last time uh, I was there, and we called last minute and. We were like, you know, we've, we're going to be there. We want office party. Um, and she was like, oh, mm, no, I can't. See, now I've got a waiting list for my business. And I was like, oh, but wait, we, we like featured you in videos. We've done so much with you. And she's like, mm -hmm, get in line because now I'm online distributing and I'm in grocery stores and I have a retail storefront. And I was like, you are super awesome. I was about to use a different word, but you're, you're badass. You're pretty awesome. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about... Um, Andrea Chen, who uh, started She's amazing. Propeller uh, in the city of New Orleans, a social uh, entrepreneur incubator. And from Propeller, I mean, it really has um, um, given women um, a, just a lead in not only startups, uh, but whether it's from education, wellness. I'm thinking about, you know, the uh, infant mortality rates, and I'm thinking about benchmark uh, birthmark doulas that started there. Um, from green infrastructure, engineering. So it, I'm thinking about Propeller and Andrea Chen there. Yeah, she is, thanks. It's really hard. I'm, I'm like you, no matter who I say, somebody's gonna say, well, you didn't mention me. Uh, but, um, you know, we have some amazing, um, female entrepreneurs, Brooks Bell is one of the ones I talked about who has this data analytics program and she's one of those people that I talk to her and I understand her for about the first 10 minutes and then she's off into another stratosphere. But she also bootstrapped her business and we've talked a lot about that. We have a chef, Ashley Christensen, who just you know, started in behind the bar in a restaurant and is now a James Beard Award winner and has uh, unbelievable in the way she nurtures other restaurateurs and brings people in and works with them and helps them get started. And the restaurant culture in Raleigh is amazing. They don't really see each other as competitors. They understand the more they build each other up, the more they all succeed. So uh, she's amazing. And then we have a woman named Cindy Whitehead who started, she invented the female Viagra and <laughs> sold it. And now she has this pink incubator. She says it's to break the pink ceiling and it's all focused on women entrepreneurs and she's done amazing things with that. Thank you. I'm going to, I have to give a shout out, and, and, I would, and it's to Rhonda Grayer uh, with W.T. Stevens. It's a construction company, and, it's, and she is in charge of it. And uh, her father started it, but she took it over. And they are actually uh, one of the construction companies, one of the largest ones that's removing the lead and galvanized pipes in the city of Flint. And uh, people were surprised because you don't have many women in construction. And I remember we were very intentional. I didn't know she was going to end up with one of the bids, but I remember when we were putting this out for bid, I didn't want to put it out in one big lump to say, can somebody come and change 18, 20,000 pipes? I broke it down in smaller bundles so local uh, companies would have the opportunity and the finances to be able to bid on this. 
and uh, she was one of the companies that got it. And it was the first time, it's, I don't know if it's exciting or sad, it's all of those things, but it was the first time in the history of the city of Flint uh, that a woman-led company, an African-American company, got a multi-million dollar contract in the city, and it's by a woman that's helping to remove those pipes in the city of Flint. Yeah, So we're going to transition. Um, thank you so much. You get to, you know, I mean, I was going to put my paper aside, but you have to grab it and start taking notes because these are things that, you know, a little bit of here and there you can put in your cities. And thank you for our conversation. Um, okay, so now it's my distinct pleasure to move on with our program and um, introduce Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Um, we're very honored to have her join us. Um, she's my member of Congress, but that's not why she's here. It's because she's awesome. Um, she's a longtime champion of women empowerment, equity, and equality and inclusion, um, all the things that the U.S. mayor is about. Um, and she's in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, she's representing the 13th Congressional District. She was first elected in 1998, and she effectively serves San Leandro and our neighbors as a member of the powerful House Appropriations Committee and the Budget Committee. And we're so proud and grateful to see that Congresswoman Lee recently was appointed to the House Democratic Leadership overseeing the Steering and Policy Committee. Her appointment so well deserved after her decades of leadership in the House, and she's been a champion of ending poverty. She addressed the HIV AIDS epidemic, and we just really thank her for her engagement and how much she cares, and especially about women. And I heard she flies coach. So, all right, Congresswoman Lee. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to be off of the hill for a minute and to be with so many powerful women. And let me just thank the panelists, all of you. I tell you, um, our time is now. Your time is now. And I want to just um, say to my mayor, Mayor Cutter, congratulations, first of all. And thank you for the invitation to be here. And I really want to applaud your leadership and all of the great work that you're doing in one of the cities in my district, the city of San Leandro, which under my mayor's leadership, it has been consistently one of the top digital cities in the country. And so I am so proud of you and my city. And to all of our mayors on the panel and to all of you, again, thank you for your service to our communities and, and to our nation. Now is the time for women and the voices of women to rise up and to lead. You really are a powerful group of women whose voice and whose work and whose intellect are badly needed for such a time as this. Now, this was um, a very lively discussion. I heard some of it, uh, and thank you so much for giving me a chance just to be with you, because I have to get back to the Hill. But this discussion and what you're talking about today, uh, it um, comes on the, at the, toward the end of Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, 90th birthday celebration. Of course, our drum major for peace and justice. Now, one of my favorite quotes was delivered, though, by uh, Coretta Scott King, just three weeks after Dr. King's assassination. And I want to read you this quote, because I'm reminded of this quote today as I was coming over to visit with you. She said, the woman power of this nation can be the power which makes us whole and heals, and she said, the rotten community, now so shattered by war, poverty, and racism. And Coretta went on to say, she said, I, had, I have great faith in the power of women who will dedicate themselves wholeheartedly to the task of remaking our society. Remaking our society. This is never truer than today, and that's what you all are doing. Now, on the Hill in Congress, we just welcomed uh, the most diverse Congress in history. The most ever in history. Record number of women. For the first time, we have 113 women as members of Congress. 113 women. So we are seeing in action the woman power of this nation that makes us whole. Now, let me say to you that uh, I was elected, and I'm sharing this story to see uh, 
how far we've come, but how far we need to go. I was elected in 1998, and I was then, in 98, the 20th, only the 20th African-American woman elected to Congress. Now that's since 1789, 1789, okay? And uh, so it's, really time. <laughs> also, there has never been an African-American woman in the leadership of the House since 1789. And so now, as co-chair of the Steering and Policy Committee, it's really time for women and women of color uh, to rise to that challenge, and I think about this every day, of really helping to remake our society. Because I know personally, many of you know, many of you know that all too often we're left out of the leadership table. It's also sadly well established that women of color are less likely than their white male counterparts to get funding for new businesses. So I'm thrilled to be here today to tell you a few things about myself and how I think we can empower women, specifically women of color in our communities. Now, first of all, as a uh, young single mother in my 20s, I fell on very hard times while raising my two boys after a divorce. But I was determined to go to school and get my degree. But I had, was on food stamps and public assistance, which really was that bridge over troubled water for me. Because I never would have made it had it not been for my government, and the people of this country, understanding that young women like myself needed that help. Now, I came to Washington, D.C. as an intern for the great late Congressman Ron Dellums, who recently passed, who I worked for for 11 years. I started as an intern in his office, but I became his chief of staff. And during that time, and this is dating me, but during that, that time, there were only two women on Capitol Hill who were African American. That was myself and Shirley Chisholm's chief of staff, Carolyn Smith, too. We're still fighting for diversity and inclusion on the Hill, but we've come a long way. Now, I did get my master's degree, my master's in social work, again, worked for Ron, but I went back to California, continued to work for Ron, and then I started my own business. I became a federal contractor, an 8A contractor in the Small Business Administration. Now, because of the 8A program, and it was really hard for me as an African-American woman to navigate all this. I opened this business and I employed between 400 and 500 people for 11 years, 11 years. This was extremely difficult because, as you know still, many of the barriers, access to capital, identifying contracts, selling your company as a woman, and then as an African-American woman, a woman of color, it was extremely difficult. But I had to break that glass ceiling for others, and we did. And then when Ron retired, I ran for his seat, and I've been here in Congress now uh, 21 years in April. And so part of what I have to do, like what you're doing, I know, is to help women set up their own businesses, help them cut through the red tape, help them identify access to capital, help them understand how to write their business plans. And really, there's so many brilliant women out here who can start businesses, run businesses, employ people, and contribute to the economy. The struggles, though, with regard to women in business are reflected, and I want to cite this 2017 report by the Center for Global Policy Solutions. It estimated that the systemic discrimination faced by entrepreneurs of color has resulted in 1.1 million fewer businesses in the United States. That's 1.1 million businesses missing from your communities. 1.1 million businesses that could be employing people if not for the systemic and the structural discrimination that many of us still face. So, I'm working like you are to support other women and minority small businesses to ensure that the federal government, con their contracting policies are equitable and inclusive. Since 2007, 
women-owned businesses grew 58%, 58%, now that is phenomenal. But get this, business own, businesses owned by women of color at a rate three times that, <clears throat> excuse me, they grew at a rate three times of that. In 2018, businesses owned by women of color accounted for nearly half of all women-owned businesses. Now that's phenomenal, but that took a heck of a lot, and I knew, know that took a lot at the local level as mayors, helping these women of color through local efforts to support them. African-American women-owned businesses grew by 164%. So that's progress. So with all the noise about us going backwards, and many of you know things are happening that aren't too moving forward for women, um, we're still staying the course and we're still fighting. And the progress, of course, is in danger. So many companies now with the shutdown are losing their revenue. People are not being employed. You know, that it's a very difficult time in terms of their credit, access to their lines of credit, and, and so we've got to end this shutdown and end it now because it's hurting so many contractors and dedicated civil service. So, so we have to do that. And so finally, let me just say, uh, economic development alone is not enough to empower women. We need to think about all of the barriers that lock women out of entrepreneurship. That includes, and I remember this very well, health care, uh, access to affordable child care, college costs, the skyrocketing housing prices. Mayor Cutter knows in my district, in my area, it's off the scale now. So many people now are homeless, can't afford to live in my congressional district and outdated infrastructure. Communities of color with high poverty rates also are plagued now, again, with redlining, workplace discrimination, underfunded schools, and crumbling infrastructure. So implementing inclusive policies to help empower women of color entrepreneurs and women in general is just the beginning. I implore you to think about your own stories and your constituent stories. You know, find the woman power that you have found in yourself in others. Uh, we've got to topple these institutional barriers that lock out women. We've got to topple that. So thanks again for inviting me to be with you. This is discussion on the woman power of this nation and the work that remains to make this nation whole is extremely, extremely important. Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress. Shirley. Remember Shirley, she was my mentor. She encouraged me to get involved in politics. And she said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Well, you all have brought your chairs and you're here to stay. And so thank you again so much for your leadership, for your voice, and for your woman power. So important. It's good to see everybody. Okay, so thank you, Congresswoman, for being with us today. Um, and mayors, thank you for being with us and sharing some of your sights as we sit around and talk. Um, we're going to conclude our session today, and I'd like to remind you that we have a best practice forum on tourism, entertainment, sports, being chaired by my good friend, uh, Reno Mayor Hillary Sheevey. And um, she can also tell you a little bit about Burning Man. I mean, you really should ask her questions. <laughs> Um, I was with her um, at Burning Man last year, and um, she really put together a great session. There's nothing like actually going on a trip with some mayors when you're just living and, and really figuring out, um, you know, just being people and talking about different things and talking about things that are important to you. And really that's how you get together and that's how the things that's you know, get your ideas going. So thank you for that. That session's in Federal A and B rooms, and it starts at 5.30. Thanks so much. <laughs>